One thing I want you to notice, right? If we pretend that this is a two-way ANOVA, if we pretend there's a, this is a two-way ANOVA, we have how many, like, how many um, levels of this factor? Four. And what about this, the kids, if we think of this as a factor? Also four, right? Which would give us how many cells? 16, right? But these cells are special. Remember, when we had cells before in our two-way ANOVA, we had several scores in each cell, right? How did we find SS within, or MS within? How did we find MS within? I kept drilling this into you. With a two-way ANOVA, what was MS within? The average of the variance is for what? Yeah, for the cells, right? It was the average of the variances for the cells. Look at these. If we think of these as cells, can I find the average of the variances for each cell? No. Why? There's only one score in each cell. OK? So the way we're going to do this, bless you, is going to have to be a little different. We're not going to have an SS or an MS within. We're not going to have an MS within. So we're going to have to find a different denominator of our F ratio, and that's called the error term. Right? OK. So let's take a look at this. If I wanted to find the sum of squares for the total, it would be NT times the variance of all the scores. I could put all 16 scores in, get the variance, multiply it by NT, and that would give it to me. And the same thing with all of these. Let's actually do these computations, because that'll make it real clear. I'm not going to put the 16 numbers in for SS total. You can go back and do that if you want. OK. So now, what I'm going to calculate, the first thing I'm going to calculate is SS column. OK? SS column. Now, in the context of repeated measures, SS column equals SSRM. OK? Truly, the only thing that's really going to annoy you about this chapter is that he changes names of things for good reason, but you have to be on top of it. So S is column, right? That's going to be finding the differences among the column means. That's our repeated measures factor, right? In this case, it's time of measurement. So this is going to be NT times the variance of the column means. OK. So if we do this, first of all, what is our NT going to be? Yes, yeah, 16, good. 16 times the variance, and we have four column means, which I'm going to put in. That's my sum of swear, squares for the column. Oh, are we doing that again? Do something with it, right? Let's do it there. Put it all the way down and then up and then down. OK. Now what I want to find is SS for the row. OK? That name is going to change to SS sub, right? Because it's going to be the sum of squares for the subjects those individual subjects. That's why SSR is going to be SS sub. So it's going to be NT times the variance of the row means. And we happen to have four here as well. Let's put those in. OK, that gives us our sum of squares for the row. Now, 
What we need to calculate for this is the error term, right? That is going to be, there is no SS within. We have no SS within here. It's going to be SS interaction, right? Essentially, the interaction between each person and the condition that they're in, right? In a two-way ANOVA, we had an interaction of two factors. So here, there's going to be, in essence, an interaction between the person factor and the condition factor. And that's going to be our error term. So how do we count? To calculate SS interaction. It's going to be, and by the way, we're going to change the name on that as well. It's called, he calls it, he starts out by calling it SS interaction, which makes sense in this context, but the name we're going to use for it is SS residual. And when you see how we calculate it, it'll make sense because it's SS total minus SSRM minus SS sub. Okay, so you can think of it as SS residual, because why? It's what's left over. If you have SS total and you take away the repeated measures factor and we take away the subjects factor, what's left over is the interaction. All right? Now, actually, what I'd like to put up before we put everything in is the summary table, because you're going to see it's a little different. Okay, this top part, and I'm going to put some notation here so you understand what's going on, is between, but it's between subjects, between subjects. So this is SS sub. Okay, and what had we calculated that to be? That was 13. We're going to put a within subjects here just to hold the place, but we don't calculate it. It's made up of between treatments, okay? Now, between treatments, that is my SSRM. And that was 77, okay? Then we have the interaction, which is going to be, again, we'll call it residual as well. And that's going to be SS residual or SS inter, whichever. And that is going to be 11. And then we have our SS total. OK, and SS total stays the same. OK, you see, right, you've done all these computations. It's just a matter of keeping straight what the names are and where they go here. Okay. Again, remember, SSRM is the column factor. Try to remember that. Okay, so we have all of the sum of squares that we actually need. So now we need to figure out the degrees of freedom. All right, so let's get the degrees of freedom first for the RM factor, because that should be easy and it should be a little intuitive. Can you think what the degrees of freedom would be for the repeated measures factor? Because again, that's column. Any thoughts? You could read it off the page, but yeah, right? It's C minus 1. It's the number of columns minus 1. And what about for degrees of freedom for the subject factor here? And again, I call it factor kind of loosely. That's the row. Yeah, again, that's also going to be 3 because it's going to be the number of rows minus 1. Can you think then what the interaction is going to be, degrees of freedom interaction? Think back to 2A ANOVA, what the degrees of freedom are for the interaction. Yeah, right? It's degrees of freedom row times degrees of freedom column. So here it's the same thing. So what is that going to be? Yeah, 9. Okay. 
Okay. And the degrees of freedom total are going to be what? 15, yeah. Another way, by the way, he has that formula, another way of writing that formula for degrees of freedom total, and this is just to help you keep things straight, is NC minus 1, right? C is the number of columns. N is the number of subjects, right? Although, again, subjects is kind of deceptive. It's actually more like the number of rows. Because right now, we have the same subjects measured multiple times. But we're also going to have a scenario where we have different people in different conditions, but we're going to analyze it as a repeated measures ANOVA. Just like when we did matched versus repeated measures. OK, it's the same idea. It's the same idea. OK, so what do we have? So then we have to find our, right, what do we have to find? Our mean squares. How do I get my mean squares? How do you always get mean squares? Divide by degrees of freedom. Since it's only one question, the degrees of freedom, we, um, the mean squares we need are this one and this one, only those two. We only have one question, right? So there's only going to be one f. So we need the numerator and the denominator. This is going to be the numerator. This is going to be my denominator now. OK? It's not ms within. We don't have an ms within here. It has to be the mean square interaction or the mean square residual. That's going to be our denominator. So how do I get my f? <coughs> right? It's just going to be ms rm divided by ms inter or residual, whichever. Whichever word you want to use. Oops. Sorry. It's hard to write down here. Okay. Does anybody have questions on where these numbers are coming from? OK, good. How do I test this for significance? Now I need a critical value. What are the degrees of freedom going to be for this critical value? Again, numerator, denominator. What degrees of freedom went into the numerator? What degrees of freedom went into the denominator? 3 and 9, that's it. OK? So what's our conclusion here? We reject the null. What's my null? Yet that there's no differences among those times of being measured. But so we reject that and we say, yeah, there is a difference. Meaning what? Does the behavior mod technique have an effect or no? Yeah, it does. It does. Of course, we don't know exactly where. right? We could take guesses, but we don't know exactly where the differences are. What would we have to do? We'd have to follow it up with tests, OK? Where we, we're not going to talk about that yet, but that's what we'd have to do. OK? Questions? All right. That's your basic repeated measures ANOVA, OK? So we're going to do more examples, but we just have to talk about some concepts behind it. Now, I believe I said everything here. Yeah, OK. OK? Just take a look at this. I basically said this, but let's take a look. If I did an independent ANOVA, right? My SS total is made up of my SS between and my SS within. In the repeated measures ANOVA, that SS total, again, total variability doesn't change. It's how far each score is away from a grand mean. It doesn't change. What changes is how we break it up. So for the repeated measures ANOVA, my SS total is divided into my SS repeated measures, that component, plus 
the component due to the people, right, as this sub, plus the interaction of those two things. That's what, it go, what goes into it. Okay? If the groups are matched, right, so SS within is essentially divided. This is, in essence, is SS within. The SS sub and the SS interaction, that essentially makes up SS within. So what we're saying is SS sub, remember, when we did the match T, we were able to, to subtract out extraneous variance. Do you remember that? We got rid of some of the variance that was due to individual differences. That's what SS sub is here. You notice, S sub didn't play any part in the ANOVA, right? The F test that I actually did, it's taken out. We ignore it. So S sub reflects those individual differences. What you're hoping for is that your S sub is big and your S interaction is small, right? Because if your S interaction is small, that gives you a large F. That gives you a large F. Okay. So if you have good matching, that is, if the correlation among the sets of scores is high, then SS sub gets larger and SS interaction gets smaller. If you have no relationship, if your correlation is zero, then it won't make a difference. Then it doesn't help you. Again, just like with a match T, if there's no correlation, that technique doesn't help you. If there's high correlation, it helps you a lot. Same thing here. And again, the trade-off will be degrees of freedom, right? You'll have fewer degrees of freedom, but that's not usually a big problem. Um, so this is a graph of these students. Now, again, if you remember with the smokers, what we saw when we graphed it is there was, there was consistency among the subjects. That's essentially what you're looking for. And in the graph, again, let's go back to what SS interaction is. SS interaction, if it's small, that means there's little interaction. If there's little interaction, what does that mean the lines should look like? More parallel. If those lines are parallel, right? If they're all parallel, that means the kids are doing the same thing. Regardless of how many outbursts they started with, they're all decreasing. Right? There's consistency in that pattern. That's what we want to find. We don't care that this one started up here and this one started up there. What we're looking for is the consistency of the pattern. As these lines are more parallel, SS interaction is smaller. If SS interaction is smaller, your F is going to be bigger. And you'll be able to detect the differences across the conditions. All right, so I said this. Let's see if there's anything more to say on this. Mm -mm. No. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I said this before, but it bears repeating. Differences in overall level between subjects contributes to the size of SS sub, but not to SS interaction. Again, it's like making the um, denominator smaller in our match T. We made our denominator smaller because we got rid of that extraneous variance. Now, we're going to have some problems, though, right? It's not going to be simple. What was the major problem we had in repeated measures when we did just two groups, like a before-after design? What, was our, what were basic problems? Do you remember? Your basic problem, I test people, what? Order effects. Hmm? Order effects, dealing with order effects. So you have the same problem. Hmm? You still have order effects. You could have practice or fatigue effects. What did we do before to fix our fatigue, our simple order effects? What do you do to fix simple order effects? Counterbalancing. Counterbalancing. Right? I show A and then B. Next person comes in, I show B and then A. But what happens if you don't have just two things, but you have three things or four things? Right? A person has to see A, B, C, and D. How do you counterbalance with that? Well, that gets really more complicated, right? Because if I have four, let's say I have four conditions, right? I want people to see A, B, C, and D. How many orders is that to be totally counterbalanced? 
24. It's 4 factorial. Remember what factorial is? 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. That's how many orders you would need to have it completely counterbalanced. You understand what that means? That means, in theory, if you were doing a study, you would have to have not just 24 people to do each of those orders, but you might have, need to have multiple people in order to make sure that those, those order effects are balanced out. And it's just, that's just for the order effects. Okay, So that's not an effective way to do it. An effective way to deal with it is something called a Latin square design. And I'll talk about a Latin square design at the end of this chapter. But it's the way that we figure out how to get rid of order effects, simple order effects, not carryover effects, simple order effects in repeated measures design. Yeah? Because you'd, have, you'd need 24 different orders. Right? I was saying before, if you have two orders, it's like person one comes in, you give this order. Person two comes in, you give that order. You have to have 24 people just to get through the orders. It's just not practical. Okay? So we're going to use a, we'll talk about what a Latin square design is later. What if you have differential carryover effects? We remember what carryover effects are, right? Those are things that the effect of one stimulus on presentation of the next stimulus. And that's not simply dealt with. Right? Like if a baby sees a happy stimulus and they're fine, and then they see an angry stimulus and they're crazed from it, that makes them really upset, and then they can't play anymore, well, you need to figure out a way to deal with that. Okay, Counterbalancing, Latin square design does not fix carryover effects. We talked about it. Again, it's the same as with a match design when you have two. Okay, it doesn't fix that. Um, with more than two treatment levels, the possibility of complex asymmetrical carryover effects increases. What do we mean by complex and asymmetrical? Well, if you're presenting four things, maybe item two, condition two, has an effect, and condition three has an effect, a carryover effect. Not just one at this point, right? So it could get really complicated. And asymmetric, it could go in one direction and not in the other. So it's really, that can be a mess. So sometimes, depending on what you're dealing with, if you're dealing with adults or you're dealing with you know, simpler things, sometimes you can just put space between treatments. Let's say you're talking about drugs. You're testing four different antidepressants. All right? So you might be able to use time, right? You have somebody be on it for six weeks, and then they have to be off for a a good period of time and then try another one, that can happen. But just like with the match teeth, sometimes you need different subjects, right? Those were, that was a matched pairs design, right? Not a before after design, but a matched pairs design. So what's the analog here? It's something called a randomized blocks design, a randomized blocks design. So what do we mean by a randomized blocks design? Well, let's say you have, you have an experiment, and the four conditions are going to create carryover effects. So you can't measure the same people under four conditions. You can't measure the same people under four conditions. So what you really need is people, different people under each of the conditions. So what you do is you're going to match them again, just like we did with two. But you have to match four of them. So, that, so let's say you're matching on, let's say it's something simple like matching on IQ. So you get four people with similar IQ. That is called a block. That's called a block. Then what you do is you randomly assign each person from that block to a particular condition. That is called a randomized blocks design. And then you get the next set of four people that are matched on IQ. That's another block. OK? Um, so they refer to it as an RB ANOVA, a randomized blocks ANOVA. You analyze it the same way. You analyze it the same way. Um, when the number of subjects in a block is the same as the number of treatment levels, like I said, four subjects for four levels, 
Then you analyze the randomized blocks ANOVA the exact same way that you analyze the repeated measures ANOVA. Okay? So again, it's just like a matched pairs design. It's, it's the same thing. All right, let's do another example. So this is about meditation. Are there physiological effects of meditation? So the following data are based on Wallace and Benson. They, had, they did a study in 72. And the dependent variable is oxygen consumption in cubic centimeters per minute. So what do we have here? We have five people that took part. And again, this is still a before-after design. This is not a randomized blocks design. It's still the same people here, just to make sure you're clear on that. So we have before meditation, during meditation, and after meditation, they measured their oxygen consumption. So again, it's one question. The question is, does oxygen consumption change over the times it's being measured? All right? Take a look at the means just for a moment. Right? The means, these column means. Any thoughts on those column means? Do you think there's a difference? Do you think there's not a difference? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like, well, what it looks like if we're going to look at it, the graphs, is it starts up here, goes down here, and then goes up there. And you'll notice that the before and after look very similar. They look very similar. OK, so let's actually do the computation on this. Let's set up our summary table. And then we'll put in what we need to put in. Okay, and on top again is between subjects. I'm just writing these multiple times so you get used to it. Okay, so let's look at our hypotheses first, right? How would you set up your null hypothesis? Well, it's the same as when we do a one-way ANOVA. Let's see. Right, you're just saying that the means of those three treatments are equal to each other. An alternative? What's the alternative? No? Yeah, the null is not true, right? Because there's so many ways for them to not be equal to each other. We don't list it. We just say that. <laughs> OK? All right, so we're going to do repeated measures ANOVA on this. And so let's first get us this total. So now we have to figure out what's NT here. Look back at that data and make sure. What is NT? Fifteen. Yeah, fifteen. Okay? By the way, so that's why I don't always like, because you have this distinction between repeated measures and randomized blocks, right? Repeated measures uses the same people. Randomized blocks uses different people. But your NT would still be the same. 
That's why I don't always like saying it's the number of subjects. It's really the number of observations. OK, so we have 15 times. And I'm going to give you, here I'm going to give you the actual variance instead of writing all the scores or whatever. So you can check this when you do it. You should definitely be doing these on your own for practice. OK, so there's 15 scores that would be put in there. OK, the next thing we're going to do is the repeated measures factor. So that's nt times the variance of what? So the repeated measures factor. So it's going to go in there. Column means. Column means, right? You're looking to see if there's a difference between before, during, and after meditation. That's the repeated measures effect. Now let's get us a sub. So that's going to be nt times the variance of. Yeah, that's the row means. Remember, subjects, you know. decimal places so you don't have rounding errors. OK. Then the last thing we need here is the interaction. So that's going to be SS total minus SSRM minus SS sub. Okay, now let's just put everything in there now. Questions where any of those numbers come from. Let's get our degrees of freedom. All right. What are the degrees of freedom going to be between subjects? How many subjects are there? Let's go back and look. How many subjects are there? Five. So what are our degrees of freedom going to be for subjects? Four. What about between treatments? RM. Degrees of freedom RM. Freedom. Two, yeah. Right, because there's three treatments there. Okay. Yeah, notice that notice the wording, right? You'll talk about between treatments or the number of treatments, but we also talk about it as the repeated measures factor, how many levels of it. <coughs> That's all the same. All right, what about for the interaction? How many degrees of freedom? Eight, yeah. And then for total, 
we have 14 good. Which mean squares do I need? Yeah, RM and interaction. By the way, look how much smaller that MS interaction is. And you'll see why in a minute. So we get our F. And everybody knows where that F is coming from? Right? It's the ratio of those two mean squares. OK. So that's a pretty big F, right? But we're still going to test it for significance. So my F critical value is going to have how many degrees of freedom? 2 and 8. Good. Which is pretty much what we expected. So what's the deal here? Yeah, we reject saying what? Yeah, there's a difference in what. Again, folks, you know, I ask you to be specific. You might as well practice it here before you get to an exam. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a difference in the amount of oxygen consumed or the oxygen consumption as a function of when they were measured during meditation. Okay. Now again, we can't say exactly where. From the data, it looks really clear to us that there is no difference between before and after, but the during is probably different from the other two. But again, you'd have to follow this up. You'd have to follow this up. Can I remove this? Yeah. Everybody's good with that? Okay. Let's take a look at the picture, the graph on the next page. Look at that. Does it look like there's a lot of interaction there? No, right? Because the lines are parallel, and that's what's going on. Even though somebody's oxygen consumption started up there and someone started down there, what happens is during meditation, they're all being reduced. And that's what you want to find out. That's what you want to find out. So very little interaction. OK. Um, if you followed it up with post hoc tests, just like for a one-way ANOVA, or for a two-way for that matter, they can be pairwise, or they can be complex. Right? Any of that is possible. Um, now, this is the situation. See, I don't really want to talk about this so much because there's an important assumption we have to make in order to be able to do this. So I think I'm going to come back to this. If you were going to use one of these regular post hoc tests, then you would have to remember, like in HSD or LSD, we had MS within in the formula. Here, you wouldn't use MS within. You don't have an MS within. You'd have to use MS interaction or MS residual. Okay? If you were doing the simple post hoc tests, which again, I'm going to have to specify when you can use them and when not. OK. So now we have to talk a little more theory. All right, we're going to talk about that residual component, essentially SS interaction or SS residual. Right? There are issues in repeated measures design that don't arise in independent groups designed. Okay? There are issues when you're measuring the same people or there's a relationship that you don't get if you're using different people. For example, let's consider what this null hypothesis is. Okay? This null hypothesis is that the mu, mu1 is equal to mu2 is equal to mu3. All right? That's what we've done. And when you have independent groups, there's only one way you can get that, and that's as if the means are equal. However, in a repeated measures design, there are two different ways to get that null hypothesis. Okay? One is with interaction, one is without interaction. For example, look. Okay? On top here. Mu1 is equal to mu2 is equal to mu3. Why? 
Because if I got the averages, right, all those means would be equal to each other. They would all be equal to each other. This, this person is not changing before, during, or after the treatment. It's not making any difference whatsoever. So this is a way of getting the null hypothesis that there's no difference among the groups without interaction. However, if you're measuring the same people, there's another way to get that null hypothesis, and that's with interaction. right? The means would still be the same as if there's no change. But each person is changing very differently. So that's a complication that we get here because there's an interaction of the person with the treatment that you don't get if you're using different people. right? Because if you're using different people, each person only sees one treatment. But if you're using the same people, they all see all of the treatments. And they respond to them differently. So this is another way that the null hypothesis can be true, which gives us a problem. Now, let's take a look at what these ANOVAs look like then. Okay, If we did an independent group's ANOVA, then our F was just, this is the numerator, this is the denominator, right? Our estimated treatment effect, whatever is going on between the means, plus a between group estimate of variance, right? That was our signal and noise. That was what the numerator was for your basic average independent groups ANOVA. And then the denominator was just also noise. When I made it simple, right? Signal plus noise over noise. That's really all it was. In a repeated measures ANOVA, it's more complicated because we have the treatment effect. Right? How are the means different? That would be our signal. Plus an estimate of interaction each person with the treatment. Plus error, plus noise. Okay? Divided by, well, this is in the denominator too. That's why we're using MS interaction, because it has this interaction also, plus some noise. Okay? Because we can't really tease apart how much is due to just error and how much is due to the interaction. That's the problem. Okay, So the denominator is MS interaction. Okay? If this is assumed to be zero in the population, right? if there's no interaction, you just have error. You would just have error. Right? If it's not assumed to be zero, then you have error plus the interaction. That's fine. And we also have interaction that shows up in the numerator because each treatment is a reflection of an individual's reaction with it. So that's why this is, more, this is a more complicated design. Okay, So this is pretty much what I had said before. The denominator is considered to be the sum of both the true amount of subject by treatment interaction and error. So that's why we refer to it as MS residual. We talked about that. We also talked about this. There's no separate estimate of error. There's no MS within. We can't separate the effects of interaction and error. So we use the term MS residual or SS residual. Or SS error, again, right? What's the error term? When I use the expression error term, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? It's the denominator of the F ratio. So in one way and two way ANOVA, what was it? MS within. In a repeated measures, ANOVA, or a randomized blocks design, it's going to be MS interaction. Okay? That's the stuff you have to keep straight for yourselves. OK. Let's talk about the assumptions of a repeated measure ANOVA. Some of these are typical, right? Independent random sampling. That is of, right, if you're doing repeated measures, you're doing the same person. Each person should be independent of the other people. Okay? You can have order effects, and that's a problem. If you did a randomized blocks design, then you need to have randomization of who gets into which treatment. If you don't, that's useless. Okay? Normal distributions. We all kind of know that, right? The normal distribution, the dependent variable should be normally distributed. That's fine. But it follows a normal distribution in the population 
for each treatment level. That's one assumption. Another assumption is that the joint distribution, all levels of the independent variable, follow a multivariate normal distribution. Now, when we talked about one variable in ANOVA, so it was just a normal distribution. When we talked about regression, right? Regression, we had one variable on the x-axis, one variable on the y-axis, right? We had two different variables, and then it's probability. Does anybody remember what that was called, that distribution? It was kind of hat-shaped, remember? <coughs> bivariate normal distribution, a bivariate normal distribution, right? Two things, bi, OK? Now we have a multivariate normal distribution. If all of the things are mapped accordingly, then they will create these normal distributions. We cannot do this. We cannot show a picture of this because you have multiple levels. All right? So it's complicated, but you have to meet this assumption. And again, if you were doing this in a higher level stats class, like um, you know, a graduate class or something, you would be taught ways that you could test that assumption because it's an important thing to meet. Um, repeated measures, ANOVA is not very sensitive departures to, to normality. What's another word for saying it's not real sensitive to departures of normality? Robust. Good, robust. Okay? Because it's robust, we generally don't have to worry about that too much. Of course, if it's severely violated or if you have really, really small samples, like the examples I usually do are pretty small so I can, you know, put the data up on top very easily, then you might have to do a transformation or a non-parametric test. Again, what you're doing, if you were actually going to do this, you think of your study and you collect your data and then you test your assumptions. If you're not meeting your assumptions, that's when you have to start looking up, oh, rats, I need a non-parametric test. What is the analog to a one-way ANOVA in a non-parametric test? That's the kind of thing you have to figure out, okay? Just to tell you the practicality of this. All right, another typical assumption we think about, homogeneity of variance. Now, in homogeneity of variance, for a randomized blocks design or repeated measures ANOVA, you always have the same number of people in the cells, or at least you should. If you don't, you, have, you run into problems, right? So you should have the same number in all of the uh, possible treatments. So then homogeneity of variance isn't a problem, OK? So, so far, none of that is new. None of that has been particularly interesting, except maybe the multivariate normal distribution. Hmm? But there's another assumption which we haven't come across so far, OK? And that is homogeneity of covariance. Covariance. Anybody remember what covariance is? Covariance. You remember what chapter it was from? Does it sound vaguely familiar? No, because we didn't talk about it a lot. So, and I know that like once you're done with an exam, it's like you file it in the back until after your orgo exam or something. So does it sound vaguely familiar? Covariance. Correlation. Correlation. It was the numerator of your correlation coefficient. It was the tendency for the variables to vary together. That was the covariance. So we found the covariance when we were talking about two variables being related. Right? So now in our repeated measures design, we have not just two sets of scores that could be related, but three or four or seven. Right? All of these scores could be related to each other. We're hoping that they're related to each other. That's why we're doing this particular design. But that means that we have to talk about this assumption of covariance. So what do we mean here? So it doesn't apply when the groups are independent. Right? If they're independent, they don't vary together. So we don't even think about it. Okay? Or if the RM or RB design has only two treatment levels. We know that, right? It's only these two are related. OK, we're done. Mm -hmm. But if you have more than two levels, you could calculate the covariance, or a correlation for that matter, for each pair of levels, right? 
treatment A and B, treatment A and C, treatment A and Z, B and C, and B and Z, you could calculate the covariance for each one of those. Still with me? All right. Homogeneity of covariance exists in the population only when all pairs of treatment levels, A and B, A and C, A and Z, right, have the same amount of covariance. And actually, the good news for you is you're not going to be calculating the covariance for all of them. But it's an assumption you have to think about. Okay? Implications are difficult to understand. There's a debate about solutions if violated. All we're going to talk about is what these mean, not how to deal with it. OK? Anybody wants to know, I can talk to you about it. But for this level, we're just going to talk about the possibility of what happens when you have them and what it means. OK. If you have homogeneity variance and you have homogeneity of covariance, then you're talking about the population displays a characteristic that we call compound symmetry. Compound symmetry. And the truth is, SPSS will throw this stuff out immediately because it is important to take a look at. Compound symmetry. So what does compound symmetry mean? Compound symmetry means that the correlation coefficient, and this is the population correlation coefficient, because again, we're talking about assumptions, and these assumptions apply to populations. Assumptions apply to populations. We use the samples to evaluate it, but they're about the populations. So compound symmetry means that the population correlation coefficient between any pair of treatment levels is the same as between any other pair of treatments. OK? So the correlation between A and B is the same as between A and C and A and Z and B and C and B and Z. All those correlations, if you calculated them, would all be approximately the same. Again, what do we mean by the same? Not exactly the same, but close enough. So that's compound symmetry. If you have compound symmetry, OK, compound symmetry means you have homogeneity of variance and covariance. So if you have that, then your f critical value would be, would be found the way you normally find it, and you don't have to worry about increasing our type 1 error rate. That's the problem. If you don't meet these assumptions, what happens is you increase the type 1 error rate. And again, these are the important things I want you to get out of it. You know, not how to calculate it, but what happens if I don't meet these assumptions? Ah, it means that I'm increasing the possibility of making a type 1 error. That's a problem. OK? Now, we don't have to talk about compound symmetry as long as we meet a more lax standard called sphericity. Called sphericity. OK? So compound symmetry is the big assumption we're trying to make. We don't have to be that strict. We can actually make a smaller assumption called sphericity. Sphericity. Or circularity, it's also sometimes called. And it's defined mathematically in terms of the matrix of variances and covariances that apply to the various treatment levels and pairs of levels. What's the simple way to understand this? Look. OK, the easy way to understand this. Look at the amount of interaction between any two levels of the independent variable. All right, the amount of interaction between A and B, or A and C, or A and D, or B and C, OK? Sphericity implies that all of these interactions will be equally large. They'll be equally the same, the amount of interaction between pairs. Before, we were talking about the size of the correlation coefficients. Here, we're talking about the size of the interaction. Okay? Another way that's more intuitive to me to understand it is the second way, OK? Requiring that the variance of the difference scores, right? I have A, B, C, and Z. I have four sets of scores. I could find the difference scores between A and B, and A and C, and A and D, and B and C, and B and D, right? And C and D. I could find difference scores. Sphericity means that the variance of those different scores will be approximately the same. 
to me, I understand that much better than the size of the interaction. But whichever way works for you is OK with me. That's the basic idea. Okay, So we used MS within when we used frim dependent groups. That was assuming homogeneity of variance. Here, we're using MS interaction. Okay, This is justified by assuming sphericity. MS interaction is essentially, right? if MS within was the average of the variances, MS interaction is the average of the pairwise interactions, or again, variance of different scores. Okay? So this is justified by assuming sphericity. Now here's just a picture that can kind of indicate to you what's going on. Look. Okay? So we have three conditions. Right? We have three conditions. So look at between one and two. Does it look like there's a lot of interaction between one and two? No, right? All those lines are parallel. But if you look at the difference between two and three, there's a whole lot of interaction going on. So it's likely that you do not have sphericity in this case. Because between one and two, there's very little interaction. But between two and three, there's more interaction. And between one and three, there's probably also more interaction. OK? So that would be an indication of a lack of sphericity. And again, here's a little important point. Uh, for future research, for any of you. A repeated measures design, something that's measured over time, very often doesn't have sphericity. Because if I measure you now, and I measure you in the same thing six months from now, let's say I measure you now, next week, and in six months. The relationship between now and next week is very likely not to be the same as between now and in six months. So any time you're doing a study that involves measurements over a serious amount of time, you have to be very careful because it's often true that you don't have sphericity. All right? OK. Um, what I'd actually like to do, because I know your heads are falling apart at this point, is I want to stop here. If anybody has questions on 2A ANOVA or stuff for your exam next week, um, this week, um, you can ask them. Okay, if not, you're free to go, but it's just if anybody wants to come ask questions. <laughs>